All right, so if you have two vectors, then I guess you have this matrix A, which is known as the rank one per perturbation of the identity. And they probably call it that because as we discussed in the chapter, U times V star gives you an M by M matrix, which has rank one and it has rank one because all of its, let's see here, all of its columns are um, just different multiples of the vector V or U, one of the two. I think it's V. I think each vo each column is like can be written as V times U I or something like that. Um, but I guess it's V star, so maybe it would be the complex conjugate of V. But in in any case, all the columns are um, are scalar multiples of each other, and so you have rank one, assuming that these vectors are non-zero. Um, but yeah, so we have a rank one matrix and we add it to I and so we get what I guess is called a rank one perturbation of the identity. Why is it useful? I'm not quite sure, but I know that we can say some things about it. For example, if A is non-singular, then its inverse has the form A inverse equals I plus alpha times U times V star where alpha is some scalar and we'll figure out what it is. So let's take U and V to be vectors. I'm going to claim that A equals I plus U V star, defining A this way, is singular if and only if V star U is negative 1, i.e. the inner product of V and U is negative 1. Um, equivalently, you could have done U star V. Um, no. Because if you did... Yeah, because if you did U star V then you'd get the complex conjugate of negative 1, which is negative 1. So it doesn't matter. Okay, so let's prove this. If V star U is equal to minus 1, then A times U is, well, just by definition, it's this. So it's U plus U V star U, but V star U is negative 1, and you can pull that negative 1 scalar to the um, left side, and so you get U minus U, which is 0. So... Let's see here. The fact that u star v, that v star u equals negative one guarantees that u cannot be a the zero vector because if u were the zero vector, then v star u would be zero. So therefore, the equation a x equals zero has a non-trivial solution, i.e., the solution x equals u, and this means that a is singular because you can you can even think of this as if a um, if a x equals zero has a non-trivial solution, then um, zero is uh, an eigenvalue of a, which we discussed previously in the previous exercise. That's equivalent to a being um, a singular matrix. Okay, so we've proven that if v star u equals negative one, then a is singular. Conversely, we're going to prove that if v star u is not negative one, then a is non-singular singular. And contrapositively, if A is singular, then V star U equals negative 1. Okay, so suppose that V star U is not negative 1. Then we can define alpha equal negative 1 divided by 1 plus V star U. And here we're able to define alpha like this because the fact that V star U is not negative 1 means that this denominator here is non-zero, and so alpha is some real number. Um... If it, weren't, if it were the case that v star u equals negative 1, then we would not be able to def define alpha like this. All right. Note that alpha satisfies. If you take alpha and you multiply by 1 plus... So this is just some algebra. Um, if you multiply both sides of this equation by negative, negative the quantity 1 plus v star u... No. You multiply both sides of these, this equation by the denominator here you get a alpha times 1 plus v star u equals negative 1, and you just move everything to one side and you get 1 plus alpha plus alpha times v star u equals 0. That's a typo. Okay, so, now look at this. We have i plus u v star plus i plus alpha u v star. Yeah, there, there's probably, there's an indication that, um, like, I, I didn't chose, choose this alpha here, uh, I didn't use alpha here 
as a coincidence. I did this on purpose because this is going to be the scalar alpha discussed in the problem above, in the problem statement. Okay, so if we multiply these two things together, we get an i, we get a u v star, we get an alpha u v star, and we get a u, a u v star times alpha u v star. Okay, and then we can write this thing here. Um, alpha, we can bring the alpha out front. And then we've got a V star U in the middle, and that's just a scalar, so that can come out front too. So alpha times V star U is a scalar being multiplied by the matrix U V star. And then three of these terms have the matrix U V star, and so we can factor out the U V star and combine all the coefficients together. And the coefficients are 1 plus alpha plus alpha V star U, and hey, what do you know? We prove that this thing equals 0, and thus the product of these two matrices is i. By almost the exact same calculation, you just do i plus alpha u v star times i plus u v star, and basically you, you, you just get the, the, the terms are in slightly a different order, and this uh, the final term here, um, you get alpha times u v star times u v star which actually becomes even easier to reduce, but by it's, it's pretty much the same thing, you get i, and therefore a is invertible with inverse i plus alpha u v star. But that part we'll come back to. The important part here is that a is invertible, meaning that a is non-singular. So I guess, yeah, so a is invertible. So if v star u is not negative one, then a is not singular. And contrapositively, if A is singular, then V star U equals negative 1. And so that's the reverse direction here. And therefore, A is singular if and only if V star U equals negative 1. And so the question here was, um, let's see here, for what U and V is this matrix A singular? So now we've, now we've, so we've proven this part that, um, we have a necessary and sufficient condition on u and v to guarantee that a is singular. So for which u and v is a singular, we know that a is singular if and only if v star u equals minus 1. Um, what, else, w w what else do we have? We've also shown that if a... Furthermore, in the case that a is non-singular, we have the formula alpha inverse equals 1 plus alpha u v star, where alpha equals negative 1 over blah blah blah, over this thing. So. If A is non-singular, then its inverse does indeed have this form for some scalar alpha, and we have an expression for alpha. And so that's almost the entire problem. And the last thing is, if A is singular, then what is its null space? So what we're going to do is we're going to suppose that I can scroll up like this. There, that's good. Okay, so suppose that A is singular. I'm going to do this. This will work. Okay, so suppose A is singular. That's equivalent to V star U being negative 1. We've proven that already. So to, to, to determine the null space of A, okay, so first of all, we have A times U equals 0. We, we, because we, we proved that up here, that A times U equals 0. So the vector u must be in the null space of A. And if u is in the null space of A, then any, um, then any uh, constant multiple of u must also be in the, in the null space. Because if a u equals 0, then a times, um, if c is just some constant, then a times c u equals c, a times c u equals c times a u, which is c times 0, which is 0. So therefore, any constant multiple of u is in the null space of A, and therefore the span of u is contained in the null space of A. Now, conversely, suppose we have an, el we have an element x of the null space A. So that means that x is a non-zero, let's say that x is a non-zero element of the null space of A. So x is non-zero and it satisfies Ax equals zero. And zero is Ax, which is this thing, um, and then we multiply this out, x plus this, so this is x. Now u v star times x, v star times x 
is going to give us a scalar, and so we can bring this out front. And so 0 equals x plus the scalar v star x times u. So solving for x, we get x equals negative v star x times u. And so even though this sort of looks like an implicit function, so there's no good way to like say much about x here, we do actually see that x is just some scalar multiple of u. Of course, the scalar multiple depends on x itself, um, but that doesn't matter. What matters is that x is a scalar multiple of u, which means that x, x must be in the span of u. And therefore, um, this holds for, obviously the zero vector is going to be in the span of u, and any non-zero element of the null space is in the span of u, and therefore the null space of A is, in, is contained in the span of u. And so the null space of A and the span of u are two sets which contain each other, and hence these sets are equal. So the null, set, null space of A is precisely the span of the vector u, and this completes the exercise.